is a middle-ranking operative called Jack Burns, who comes in under the cover of uh, a man called Jameson. My father was born in London. He was a sergeant major in the army, quite a responsible position, of course. Jameson is a married man. He's got three kids, invalided out of the army with a bad heart, jobless. He is an utterly unexceptional man who lives in a little terraced house in Leytonstone. He was very friendly with a man called Colonel Isham. He uh, was something to do with the government. He ended up working in intelligence work. Now, the kind of thing he was doing was informing upon the activities of radical trade unionists. Fairly small beer stuff, but very, very important also because he had contact with the Gaelic leaguers in London. He came with good credentials and he had uh, recommendations from London. This man, Jemison, that we brought over to Dublin. He actually got as far as a visit to Collins. Jameson comes over a bit before Christmas of 1919 to Dublin and he's met by the Collins squad and he's blindfolded and he's taken to a shop. Collins was very uh, avid for new information. They could see his worth. He was handed over to Tom Cullen and myself and Tom turned around to me and said, I don't care who sent that fellow here, I don't trust that so-and-so. And then the next thing he knows, the blindfold's taken off and he is in a room and there in front of him is Michael Collins and two other people. He sees how people around Collins behave. He's in command. And this is the great intelligence breakthrough, because when he returns to London and submits to his report, he makes it clear, this is the man who is running the show. Jameson goes back to London in intelligence terms. He's done it. He hit it in one. This man Collins is the chief director of all active movements among the Sinn Féiners. He has now taken the place of de Valera due to the long absence of the latter. Jameson was the first person not so simply to meet Michael Collins, but he was the first individual to really ascertain that he was the key driving force. There's no doubt he is the organiser. For months, the British had been fighting blind. Now they knew who, if not what, they were up against. From then on, the revolution for the British authorities has a face. And that was the face of Michael Collins. The intelligence breakthrough strengthened British resolve. An outsider was brought in to shake up G Division. The British brought down from Belfast a district inspector named Redmond, who was a live wire. He looked more like a stockbroker than a policeman. It is extraordinary, he said, that we who knew Dublin so well have failed to catch Michael Collins, whereas a man who had only just arrived from England had managed to meet him more than once. Redmond told the detectives that they were not doing their duty, and he gave them one month to get Collins and those responsible for the shootings, or else he would order them to resign. He kind of marshaled them, and he showed uh, a knowledge of police methods that frightened Collins. Redmond was probably the most single serious adversary he had. After that, there were constant holdups in the city. Collins had a guiding principle in politics and war. Always get your retaliation in first. He was going to get Redmond before Redmond got him. Coming from Belfast, Inspector Redmond perhaps underestimated the difficulty of operating in what was, at this stage, utterly hostile territory. Redmond's assistant in the castle is actually one of Collins' moles in G Division. I mean, that's how grim it was. They, they would get on to a man to tell him, our colleague is leaving the office now and you'd be able to kill him on the way home. We were told that Redmond would leave the castle at half past five or six and that he usually walked home to the Standard Hotel. A time and place would be decided by Crow Street and that information would have been communicated to the squad. We had a group of men at the castle gates, a group at George's Street, a group at each end of Grafton Street, and myself and two men at the foot of Harcourt Street. Inspector Redden neglected to take even the most elementary personal precautions. He strolls back to the Standard Hotel in Harcourt Street without a bodyguard. I saw Tom Keogh and another man crossing the road to the railing side of the green. 
The team at, at the castle gates misses him. I turned, and there I saw Redmond crossing Harcourt Street, about six yards away. Kill started to run. But before he got to Redmond, Redmond was dead. Daly beats him to the punch. Kyo didn't shoot him. I fired, and he fell mortally wounded, shot through the head. Redmond's vacancy was advertised throughout the RIC. The inspector took the job, but did not go looking for trouble, and was not interfered with. G Division would play little further role in the intelligence war, but one threat to Collins remained, the British double agent from London who had won his confidence. Collins's um, inner circle had become very suspicious of Jameson. Strangely enough, the last person to become suspicious of Jameson is Collins himself. I think possibly because he was just too excited by what Jameson appeared to be offering, weapons for the volunteers. He was becoming very serious, a very serious menace. And he insisted on in seeing Collins. Collins is a blind spot, and really he saved from his own misjudgment by his own inner circle. They would feed Jameson false information, which subsequently led to British raids on various different properties. They identified him as, as a double agent. Jameson's dirty. Everywhere he's been now is under threat. Liam Tobin would come to Collins and say, this guy's got to be creased. While he ultimately is looking to reel Collins in, they reel him in. Word was sent to him that somebody would meet him and bring him to Michael Collins. He's conveyed to Ali Mung, and he's taken to the grotesquely inappropriate lover's lane. This is a one-way trip, though he doesn't know it. So you want to meet Collins, do you, said one of them. You're going to meet him in the next life. He's a dead man walking. He's just in over his head. I always hated the Irish for years and years and years. It's only in latter years I've thought that perhaps it was the government's fault for sending him with not a lot of experience. He didn't realize, I think, until the very last moment just how lethally effective they were. Stop here. I told him that we were satisfied that he was a spy, that we were going to kill him, and that if he wanted to say any prayers, he could do so. To the last minute, he said, well, you're shooting the best friend that Ireland ever had. The spy stood to attention and said, you were right. God bless the king. God bless the king.